We'll start here in verse 11. And do this, understanding the present time. The hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber, because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as, it, as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, close your, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. All right. Uh, so years ago, um, Katie and I were, got to be a part of a wedding for some friends. And uh, because we got actually invited to be in the wedding, to take part in the wedding, we also got to be a part of the rehearsal and rehearsal dinner and all of that fun stuff, which I love, especially when I'm doing a wedding, because it allows me to hear what other people say about the couple, and I get to learn a, mo- a little bit more about their lives. And it's just, it's just a lot of fun to be around. I love when, uh, when they toast one another and all of those uh, kinds of things. And sometimes, you know, those toasts, those messages are, are kind of fun, right? They're, sometimes they're full of laughter and lighthearted, and uh, they're, a lot of, they're just funny uh, and good and, and, and all of that. And sometimes they're, they can be pretty heartfelt and sweet and serious. And uh, I actually remember on this particular wedding and this rehearsal dinner that I was a part of, uh, we went to this, uh, and as we were listening to the couples uh, being toasted by their family and friends, uh, in particular, one of the people got up and said a very like heartfelt, serious, sweet uh, toast to the couple. And, and I remember as Katie and I were listening to this toast being given, uh, we both simultaneously noticed that at the table near the person uh, speaking was the groom's father. Uh, And the groom's father was both listening intently to the person speaking and also sort of absentmindedly picking up his drink to take a drink. Uh, Except for the fact that when he went to uh, take that drink, he was so focused on listening that he was kind of playing like a slow motion game of tag with the straw around the cup. You know what I'm saying? Like he was chasing the straw trying to get it, but he wasn't really paying attention. So he just kind of kept going around and around. And let me tell you all, Katie and I both noticed this at the same time and looked at each other. And you ever have those moments when you're with somebody and something happens and you just like cannot keep it together? I mean, we tried our very best. It was so sweet. There was tears falling. And Katie and I were over there losing our minds, doing the whole like shaking, you know, and covering our our mouth, like doing everything we could to keep it together. And we were not, it was not going well. And it's the kind of thing where as soon as you think you're okay, you look over at the person you're with and you just lose it again, right? So it's just this series of like trying our very best to like be appropriate people. And we just were failing in all aspects of that appropriateness. Uh, It was terrible. Uh, The family, the people that we were with, we didn't really know that well. So that was kind of awkward. They were like, what's... What's wrong with these people? I think they probably got a kick once they figured out that I was doing the wedding, but uh, we felt so bad. And I thought about that this week as I thought about this, this, uh, these words from Paul because it was so hard to, uh, it was so hard when our conduct, what we were doing, did not match the situation, right? Sweet, heartfelt situation, serious tone, tears, and tears were falling for us, but it's because we were laughing so hard and could not keep it together. Have you been around times or places or people or situations where their conduct, what was happening, did not match the situation, right? I think about people who take the polar bear plunge, like, what are you doing? That doesn't, that just doesn't match in my mind, right? Like, it's cold, it's winter, what, it, it doesn't work. Or what about if you walked in the sanctuary this morning and I announced, hey, we're getting ready to have an Easter egg hunt. Are y'all excited? Right, it, didn't, it doesn't match the season. And as we look at this text from Paul, he says to us, recognize the season that you're in. Recognize the time, the situation that's going on right now. It's always good to recognize the season that you're in so that then your conduct and your life and what you do actually matches up with what's going on. 
In a similar way, Paul says to the Roman church here, recognize the time. The word for time in this passage uh, here in the Greek is the word kairos, which sometimes is translated uh, season as well. It's a different word than uh, another common Greek word for time, which is chronos, which is where we get our word chronological from, right? The, the kind of linear sequence of time. Yesterday was Saturday, today's Sunday, tomorrow's Monday. That's the chronological flow of time, right? This morning I woke up, here we're at worship. This afternoon we'll be trying to watch football and do chores and figure out which one we want to do more of there. Cro cr that's chronos, that's the linear flow of time. But kairos... Kairos is something different. Kairos refers to the special times or seasons that are, that are kind of set apart within the normal flow of time. Right? It's, it's why we talk about things like harvest season, right? It's a special set apart season uh, within the chronological time of the year when crops are set to be harvested. It, uh, or or other, other times or other seasons. We talk about maybe even seasons of life, right? Becoming new parents. Uh, retirement, going through, uh, when you find out you have cancer and have to go through that special season of life, or nearing high school or college graduation. These are, these are set-apart times for either for us personally or for God uh, that are happen in the moment of our everyday flow of time. Sometimes in Scripture they refer to when God breaks into our chronological uh, calendars in a unique and important way. It's why Paul wrote uh, about God's plan for Jesus in Ephesians 1. He wrote, he, has made, he, God, has made known to us the mystery of His will according to His good pleasure that He set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, for the kairos. In other words, Paul is saying that uh, that God set aside the certain time and place for Jesus to come into the world. It wasn't, it wasn't random. God wasn't just like, you know what, this seems good. How about now? Like, this was a part of God's plan. Kronos then became Kairos when, when Christ stepped into our time. It's when Jesus, it's, it's similar to when Jesus began his ministry, uh, and he led, he led his preaching by saying, The time, the Kairos has come, the kingdom of God is near, repent. And believe. Jesus wasn't saying, uh, hey, it's Thursday, right? He was saying, no, that's, this is a special time. God is actively doing something significant right here and right now. And if you are going to recognize that, then the proper response is to repent and believe. Paul is saying to the church in our passage this morning, recognize, be aware of the season that it is right now. And we, just like the church back then, are called to do the same in our time and in our place right now on a number of levels. For one thing, it's why you walked into the sanctuary this morning and we saw the tree lit up and you saw decorations all around us, right? We're entering a new season that we, that the church tradition, many church traditions call Advent, uh, it's why we sing songs that are uh, seasonal hymns. It's why we see a lot of red and green and, and figurines of babies and shepherds. Uh, the church, many church traditions have long celebrated this time as the season of Advent leading up to the birth of Christ. Right? Unlike most stores, which, you know, as soon as October 31st kind of ends, right, on mid right at midnight or whatever, like all the ghouls and goblins and whatever come down and immediately the Christmas stuff comes up right like stores like to immediately run to one season to the next but we in our tradition we like to take a little bit more time to get to Christmas uh, the Advent tradition is a is a time of remembering why Christmas matters so much why does the birth of Christ mean so much to us in the passage Paul writes of a time of night or darkness uh, we remember that in the, la in the days of the last prophet of the Old Testament, in Malachi, Israel was once again a nation, but there was, there was a tremendous amount of corruption by their leaders and their priests. Uh, the people's hearts had grown kind of cold and indifferent to God, and they suffered big time from injustice and moral failures. Uh, it was rampant in the time of Malachi. And so God sent Malachi to call the people back to God to promise them that there would be a day, there would be a day when God would be coming once again in power to save and to judge the people. 
And when we say judge, judgment in the sense of setting things right, ending the corruption, bringing justice, creating new tender hearts towards God, and bringing wayward people back into relationship with the Father. The time of darkness, in other words, would give way to a new day. We know that day was promised, and yet, after Malachi, 400 years went by where things went from bad to worse. The corruption continued. Uh, Other world powers rose up and conquered the people. There are various rebellions that promised to bring salvation, and and they did bring uh, momentary times of peace, Uh, to the people, but most of them uh, happened and they were very bloody and the peace only lasted for a short time. And maybe what hurt the worst was that God seemed distant. God was distant. There was no more prophets. God's word was, uh, was gone in that time. Was God being apathetic? Did God not care? Was he silent? Could they just not hear it? Where was God? And maybe that's a question that sometimes we wonder ourselves with today as we look on our own kind of larger landscape of our time and our place. And in the midst of that darkness, the promise of Malachi that God wouldn't forget his people and would return one day, it seemed like, seemed like the flicker of a candle in the darkest part of night when darkness was all around. And yet, even despite that, there was a remnant of people who continued hoping and waiting and believing that God would be true to His Word. And so we come to this season of Advent. Advent is a word that means long-expected or long-awaited arrival. It speaks to that longing within all of our hearts for God to arrive once again, both in the world and in our lives, to revive us again to rescue us, to come in judgment in our time, in our place, to bring hope and give us hope, for, and for us who cling to that hope, who believe that there has been a light that has shone in the darkness and that darkness will not overcome it. Advent is a season to acknowledge both the darkness of night in the world and within us and also to hold fast to the hope that in the coming of Jesus a new dawn has arrived. Which is what Paul tells the believers, right? He says, For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first became believers. The night is far gone. The day is near. Wait a minute. If the night is far gone and the day is near, which which one is it? Is it dark? Is it light? And Paul's answer is yes. It's both. Right? Y'all know those moments of early dawn when it's still dark outside and yet Uh, As you see that sun creeping up over the trees or the hills, those faint hints of light shine through. And so for those brief moments, it's both dark and it's light at the same time. Paul is saying that right now, right now in the time between Christ's first advent, his first coming, and his second coming that is going to happen, this is that time that is both dark and light at once where we still experience both the darkness and the pain of the brokenness of the world in our lives, and at the same time, we have a hope and we have a light that reaches all the way to that day when He'll come in fullness and in truth. We're called to recognize that season. That we as God's people are called not just to live by the chronos of the world, right? Not just to live by the calendar of the days that can rule our lives, Uh, by all the busyness and everything going on, but to also recognize the bigger picture, the season and the times of God, as well as our own personal seasons of life that we're going through. And to consider how is God calling us to be faithful uh, in in this season of life that we're in as, as a church, as individuals, and as God, once again, we wait for that second Advent to come. How is God calling us to live faithfully and obediently? And Paul here gives us some things to consider for our own day and time. There in verses 12 through 14, he says this once again, Let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, Not in dissension and jealousy, but rather clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. 
little different translation from the Pew Bible. But he says, put aside or lay down the deeds of darkness on one hand and put on Jesus Christ, the armor of light on the other. The things that Paul tells the Roman church, I think, are specific for that church in that time. And yet, as I read through them this week, I thought, gosh, that sounds awful familiar to today's time and place as well. Maybe they have a word to speak to us today, too. He says, put aside revelry or carousing and drunkenness. Right? Looking a little bit closer at those words, carousing or revelry, which are just fun to say but not fun to participate in. Right? He's, it's a word that indicates a wild kind of partying that's often combined, especially in that day, with pagan religious worship and really no limits. No limits. No limits on the amount of food. No limits on the amount of alcohol. No limits on sexual behavior. No limits on just about anything. It was a celebration of going wild and having no limits uh, because there is no limits, right? And therein lies the issue. Because unlike a more maybe Puritan culture, which uh, in attempts to kind of curb bad behavior ends up reinforcing the idea that food and alcohol and sex are all bad, evil things. Uh, rather, Paul is saying not that those things are bad, but that when we get rid of all the limits on those things, when we take off what God has, has designated as right and godly living, or when our motives for participating in those things aren't healthy or godly, that's when we fall into sin. That's when we fall into a kind of life that can get us into trouble. How often do we try to take the limits off of things, right? Sometimes harmless. I like to take the limits off a bag of Reese's. Uh, quite often, you know, sometimes these things are kind of harmless and we think are silly, but other times it's not so funny, right? How, how often do we seek to take the limits off what we do in life as maybe a kind of comfort mechanism towards some sort of pain that we're experiencing, as some sort of means of escaping some sort of conflict or, or struggle to know and to find our purpose? We have one more drink or we go to one more party or have one more experience we have a, a, a more and more media content that we binge or whatever works for you to help you kind of go get past that hurt that's in your heart and escape for even just a little bit. Uh, I wonder if maybe these things that, that Paul talked about then can still have a place for us here and now. And again, those things uh, by themselves are not bad, but when those things, eventually we use those, uh, when we use those to get rid of maybe the pain that we're experiencing, they no longer become a means to an end. Eventually they can become an end of themselves. They become what our life is about rather than the deeper things that God is calling us to, like purpose and, and healing from those conflicts rather than simply fleeing from them in our hearts. And I wonder if ultimately they speak, to, they speak to us about a lack of hope. A lack of hope. A lack of trusting or believing that in the difficulties of life that there is a good and loving God who has our best in mind, even if that means we encounter struggle sometimes. A God who, des who designed us with purpose. And a purpose, by the way, that goes beyond our job. I can't tell you how many people I've talked to recently that are just in a job they hate. And I think it, it's because we put so many of our purpose eggs in our job basket. But purpose goes far beyond what you do for a living, right? Purpose goes far beyond that to who you are and, and who God's called you to be in all circumstances, not just on the eight to five job, right? Not just what you do to make a living. I wonder if it speaks to our need to cultivate in this time uh, patient endurance and struggle. Instead of trying to flee from the struggle that we're called to embrace it with hope, which is a deep-rooted posture of trust in God for our healing. That we don't run from the things that are, that are painful for us, but we seek our healing and we believe that God holds the key to that. Paul continues by saying, he, he writes, put aside sexual immorality and debauchery or sensuality. All of these terms speak of a sexuality that is not confined in marriage between husband and wife. Because again, this also carries with it the idea of, of excess, of sleeping around or of, not being, or, or of being ruled by sexual desire that goes against how God has designed it for us. 
And as I thought about this, that this week, I, I wondered if this speaks, this, these particular sins speak to our lack of connection as people. Because sex ultimately is about connection, right? It's about sharing intimacy, physically, yes, but also spiritually, emotionally, and personally. And we recognize that God has called us and that God has designed life so that a healthy intimacy grows out of the soils of commitment and trust, right? They go together of saying to one another, I am in this with you. Despite us still learning about one another, despite us discovering the inevitable flaws and areas of brokenness that we all have and whatever else, I'm with you. I'm committed. I'm not, I'm not leaving or running away from it. I'm here. And it's through honesty and forgiveness and self-sacrificial love that that intimacy found through sexuality actually can grow into something beautiful and wonderful. It's how we really come to know one another, not just, not just the facade that we put out there for others to see. And I wondered if it, it, that in this time, in this time of loneliness in our culture, where so often we make sex about our own personal gratification, uh, where we try to fill that need of that longing in our hearts for loneliness, uh, where we so often see ourselves and one another as objects toward that gratification rather than as sacred image bearers of God, who are seeking to, to know and to be known by God and others, how, how so often we cheapen that. We cheapen this beautiful thing that God has designed to grow intimacy and commitment and connection to make it about ourselves. And so often our culture tells us that it's all about your romantic relationships, right? Like I remember growing up, I felt like the point of basically age like 7 to age, I don't know, 30 was to find a romantic partner. Like I thought that was all that, all that it was. And praise God it happened, but if it didn't, like I felt, I felt like some people think they failed at life and we neglect the deeper other kinds of intimacies that God has given us. Friendship and family. How good is it to sit around with friends and to be connected and to laugh and to, uh, to talk about life and to wrestle with our purpose and the good and bad together. This, this time of loneliness isn't just about our romantic relationships but also the beauty of friendships that, that I, I fear are being lost Sometimes when we're so disconnected. And finally Paul writes and he talks about setting aside dissension and jealousy. Dissension, bitter disagreement, often filled with strife and violent anger. Jealousy, a deep discontentment with what you have or an insecurity about who you are. And coveting or desiring that of others, right? Whether it's their things or who they are. How many of us has, have looked at other people's lives and said, I wish that was me? In the darkness of kind of our culture that we're in, a, a, a time of outrage and anger and hostility where those things so often generate more clicks and likes than love, it's so easy for us to make caricatures of our enemies rather than recognize our common humanity with those we disagree with. Or it's far easy for us to be more bold in our hostility and say things from behind a screen that we would never say to another person in person. And I wonder in this time that we're living in, perhaps this speaks to our lack of peace and love as a society and as individuals. Especially with those people that are outside our tribe, whether that's our political party or whether that's outside of just how we uh, see things or whatever it might be. And the need for us as God's people to practice loving our enemies as Jesus taught. To practice accountability and forgiveness and reconciliation as a people. And as, I, as Paul kind of ends this, this passage here, these few short verses... Uh, I kind of want to end it as well by encouraging us to put on Jesus. And really that's what I want this whole kind of Advent season to be about for us. To look at all of those ways in which our culture uh, has kind of missed the mark in some ways and how we've kind of lived into that as people, if we're honest. And to look at the ways that God is calling us to put on Jesus. To put on that armor of light in this season that we're in. To recognize the temptations and the pressures of our day and to stand with and by Christ. To look at what does this mean? Because my hope during Advent is to dive into this more as we seek to live as a people of the, of the day. 
a people who remember that the dawn is here and that darkness is passing away, no matter how dark it might seem for you in this time. My hope is to challenge both our imaginations and our way of living to keep our minds and our hearts uh, that are so often caught fearfully staying in the dark uh, to instead be living boldly into the light, to put on Christ, which is so much more than a mindset, but it's also how we actually live and become the people that God is calling us to be, people who can endure the night no matter how long it might be, and at the same time bring other people to the light. And so the question for us to kind of end this, this message on is this, how might you be searching consciously or not, for hope and for connection and peace in your life right now? How are you searching for hope and connection and peace in your life right now? And how maybe have these good longings of your heart become co-opted by the world so that you're living instead in fear and loneliness and outrage? Do you find yourself uh, more fearful than hopeful? Do you find yourself more outraged than, uh, than loving toward people? Do you find yourself more lonely uh, in this place? Even if you're in a relationship, by all means, the loneliest place you can be sometimes is in a relationship. Uh, are, and in those places uh, of, of outrage and loneliness and, um, and, uh, and all of those things, how might Christ be calling us to something different? Psalm 139 says, Search me, O God. At the very end it says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. See if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. My hope through this Advent season is that God might stir us up together toward ways of living uh, that would help us as individuals and as a community to build fortresses of hope and connection and peace for ourselves as well as for our neighbors and world. And I hope you'll join me in that as we wrestle with those things. Let us build a community here of hope and peace and connections. And brothers and sisters, let us remember. Let us remember the good news that we have a hope in Christ uh, that a light has shone in the darkness. And darkness will not overcome it. It cannot and it will not. And so as Christ has come, so he will one day. Isn't that right? As Christ has come, so He will one day. Let us remember that this Advent season. Let's pray.